Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. How do you look at IIM people? You work with a lot of people with the two-year course in a variety of roles that you've been in. What is different about people with the two-year course, less work ex, coming onto uh, you know organizations that you've worked in, and whereas you've come from a, a different kind of a MBA, which is the ISB MBA. What is the difference between the two tribes, or is there a difference at all? Yeah. So uh, I think just to give a little bit of context before I answer the question. So I went to ISB with around close to three years of experience, which I think was below the average. So I think in our batch, the average was around 4.5 to 4.7. And uh, to be very honest, I didn't have a big idea about why I'm doing an MBA. It was I was doing a software developer job, and uh, I sort of wanted to. I realized that I wanted to change my career track. And uh, I did have an idea about product management, but it was not a clear intention with which I went to uh, ISB. So I think when I re uh, went there, I realized that there are certain advantages and disadvantages both to being sort of below the average years of experience, right? I think uh, one advantage was uh, just uh, in terms of uh, core placement sessions, uh, you have access to a lot more jobs because at the end of the day, uh, it's easier for companies to hire someone who's coming with the lower salary and give them a huge jump. And especially if they're really good, they'll be, it's easier for them to sort of make that decision. Right. Uh, when you go to ISB, because a lot of people in ISB go with like 10 to 15 years experience also, so they sort of have a slightly harder time. That's because they obviously know a lot more about what they want out of the career, so they're looking for something specific. And for companies also, they might not have those number of positions open for people that experience. So I think the first factor is, uh, for all of you guys, I think you might be going with the around two to three years of experience. Uh, that's actually, I, I consider it an advantage, because uh, if, you, if you're going for an MBA to figure out what you want to do and sort of open yourself up to all the experiences, uh, you'll have a range of options open in front of you, cross marketing, branding, product management. So um, I think that's a big advantage overall. Um, lastly, you will have a strong peer group. You know, you'll be able to learn from people who are coming with a great experience. I think one disadvantage is that a lot of material of the courses that is taught might be lost on you. Like this happened to me when we take up a course like organizational behavior. Uh, you probably won't see as much value in that course while you're studying it because you won't have real life experiences to relate to those. And uh, it's funny, like today when I work every day, I sort of get reminded of specific nuggets from some courses and I'm like, oh, this made so much sense. And then I sort of remember and I wish I had, you know, paid more attention to those yeah, courses. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's rare that uh, B-School grads say that I refer to uh, a course or something I learned on campus uh, very regularly when I'm in my day-to-day uh, -day working life. Yeah. It's like there is a big gap between what was taught to me on campus and the kind of stuff I do yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. And you are in a, in a field which is product management. Again, not really well served by campuses even today. Yeah. So uh, how do you think the MBA helped you become a better product manager? If you look at uh, product management as a job function, it's relatively new, right? So I think what is happening is you obviously have a lot of good content out there on the internet to prepare yourself every day when you face a new challenge. Like if you have a specific question around analytics, you can find great resources online. But when it comes to a structured education degree like an MBA, I think everything from the courses available uh, to the case studies that are available, they're more skewed towards um, uh, traditional job functions where there has been enough time for people to research into those and come up with case studies, right? So if you're someone taking up an MA course, you'll find a lot of Harvard case studies which take up um, historically amazing MAs and analyze them, and you'll have a lot to learn from them. I think that kind of content which B schools need around product management is sort of just starting to get uh, you know prepared. So obviously, you will have case studies around, I'm sure you'll have a case study in the future around how good an acquisition Instagram was for Facebook, right? From right. all aspects, financial, strategy, and product. But I think uh, as of now, you won't sort of see that structured courses that you probably uh, are looking for in a B-School. In terms of preparation, I think one example that I can share is from uh, my journey. So if you, so I, I went to B-School in 2013, 2014, right? And that was the time when Facebook, just to take the Facebook example, was trying to figure out its video strategy. Now, 
uh, you know that YouTube is big in uh, video and you're doing a lot of accounting courses so you sort of know how to read a financial statement. So um, one specific incident that I remember was I just sort of learned how to read a financial statement properly and I was just reading I think Facebook's financial statement for that year um, and uh, I think one of the things that caught my eye was uh, they had called out YouTube as a big competitor and they are trying to sort of uh, they said that our next year focus would be to increase video ad sales and get into that category. Now, when you're thinking from a product point of view, you would be like, okay, so this means that they will build a video product. And that's the journey which I saw from that lens once I right. had that context. And I think what Facebook has done in terms of the video product has been phenomenal. And little, little things, uh, especially if you've been a software developer before, uh, little things in terms of the UX and how they're approaching a core product like Newsfeed, to alter, to make sure the videos get promoted more, are sort of the things you start noticing uh, in your daily experience. So I think the biggest change for me has been that as instead of being a passive user of all the products around me, uh, I sort of have that business hat when I look at a product. So I, I'm genuinely interested in knowing the background around how a feature has been built. And that sort of adds a very rich flavor to how you take decisions uh, to build pro building products. So I think in that aspect, uh, B-School definitely has a lot of value. So one thing I notice, and this is something I've noticed you use a lot, is little things. Like little things that help build a particular thing. How much is product management about spotting these little things, correcting for them, and then having whatever disproportionate amount of impact in terms of, uh, you know, whatever business result you're trying to affect? And how do you go about looking for these little things? So we had a session with uh, some of the Flipkart product managers a uh, uh, couple of hours ago, and they were also talking about the five whys and how you get to the root of the problem and you don't uh, use a global problem statement and just simplify the solution. So how is little things a very important thing for a product manager to approach? I think it depends on the nature of the product. So if you talk about e-commerce, which are transaction-based products, little things like just making the checkout experience slightly faster or putting a button in a better place by A-B testing would result in a significant revenue impact and you can measure that immediately. So it's a very measurable sort of a, a change that you can make. Right. Whereas there are obviously the second kind of products which are subscription based. So in Microsoft for example, Office is a subscription based product. So when you want to take a decision around how do we improve the experience of you typing in Word, that's going to be a much more thought out research-based feature, which will probably have a longer life cycle because your goal is not a to longer optimize... A longer turnaround time as well, yeah, right? Your lo goal is not to optimize a few seconds. Uh, mm -hmm. Your goal is to sort of revamp the overall experience you have and the value you get from the feature over the long term. So I think it depends a lot on the nature of the product. And I think uh, one uh, thing that I personally try to do is to keep this context in mind when you're taking decisions because a lot of times what happens is you have experience in e-commerce as a PM and you go somewhere else and you sort of keep thinking in the same way when you need to change it. Anurag, now we'll talk a little bit about your experience just out uh, out of ISB. Was Direct the first company you joined after yes. ISB? Yeah. So uh, what were some of the roles, what attracted to you, uh, you to Direct I? Because I'm sure a lot of uh, bigger names would come on campus, but you chose to uh, go to Direct I and why and what was that journey like? If so, you could talk about one big project that you handled that you are the most proud of, that was the most challenging at Direct I. While at it, it'll yeah, be sure. great. So, uh, Directa was a day one company, and I think uh, it's probably, I'm really happy that I got the experience. And I think among all the companies for uh, product that had come on ISB on day one, um, it was one of the strongest recruiters. And I didn't know it at that point. I had, my experience of Directa was when I was studying in BITS, I, I, I was not in computer science. So, uh, I remember there was some conversation in the corridor that this company, Directa, has come on campus and it has some insane 15 rounds. So I, I, that's, that's the, uh, sort of the memory that I had of the company because it was a really picky uh, recruiter when it comes to evaluating candidates from engineering campuses. So uh, I knew about the company, but I was not aware what kind of product roles they had. So uh, what really piqued my interest was the, fa the recruitment process itself. So they are a very case study based recruiter, which means that they believe in, they know that day one is crazy, right? So you will have like a lot of short lists, at best, you'll have like half an hour, an hour to evaluate a candidate and they know that's not enough. So uh, like a lot of recruiters that follow this process, they gave out a case study and they said, take your time, take two, three weeks, come up with a solid proposal and uh, submit it to us and this will be the basis for, for your interview. So I sort of was attracted to the process because I felt it's very fair. 
Um, so I, I ended up solving two case studies for two different roles because I just wanted to uh, sort of attempt Because both. you were excited about solving yeah. the case studies. Yes, because it was just a good problem to think through and solve. Right. I sort of did that and I sort of had other shortlists as well. Um, and I think up till that point also I was not extremely sure about product management. My other shortlist was actually Microsoft Sales. Not too sure about it, but I sort of went for that as well. And I think then the interview experience itself was uh, an eye-opener for me because uh, the typical nervousness that you have in an interview is not there because sure you enter the you know interview room and you're like oh I, I don't know how I'm going to be tested, but then you are discussing your own work, right? So sort of that process feels very engaging, fair, and you can have a very good conversation rather than having these prepared answers in your head. Right. So I think uh, when and the person who took my final round, obviously Bhavan took my final round. It was a great experience talking to the founders and the CEO. That sort of did it for me that, okay, this is a great place for me to learn potentially. So I think that's how it went about it. And uh, to your second part of the question around the biggest project. So just to break up my director journey for the first two years, I was a PM with media.net. Uh, which was eventually, uh, uh, you know, acquired for around nine hundred million dollars. It was biggest, uh, uh, you know, deals in the Indian startup Indian scene, startup scene um, yeah. and uh, sort of made the founders billionaires as well. So I think the first two years were very interesting because I was doing a lot of things when I joined. Initially, I was doing growth hacking, so I was put in a role where, and I remember one statement with our CTO made, which I still sort of uh, hold true, that marketing in the future will be an engineering function, and he said that this is all growth hacking is all about. Uh, you have to build features which uh, have virality built into it. And it, it is not a new concept, but the way he put it was something very striking. And we did a lot of growth hacking for Media.net just to get publishers on board, sort of that work. And then I'm, I was looking at certain advertising products, especially the, we had a very unique AI-based product where we would can figure out from the content of the page what are the images and text we have to show to make the uh, ad extremely contextual. So we sort right. of had the technology in-house, and that was the product I worked on. And then after two years, I moved to Flock, which is uh, sort of an enterprise messaging product. And I think that's where I learned product management in the truest sense, because I think you need the right balance of data analytics uh, uh, and uh, UX to be a good product manager. And I think the UX part was not... Uh, honed well in Media.net and Flock was really heavy on you building your UX aptitude. A little bit, uh, can you tell the audience uh, a little bit about what Flock is? What is the product and yeah. then maybe get into what you were doing over there? Yeah, so uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Slack or use Slack? Okay, so Flock is essentially a Slack competitor and it's uh, completely built out of India and I always tell people, I think it's one of the top 10 products being built out of India in terms of the overall quality and the focus on UX. Because typically what happens is you, you can actually count the number of good UX-based products coming out of India. So it's very good UX and because obviously we had to compete with a player like Slack, we were really focused on getting it right. Um, and um, I think the challenge with Flock as a business has been uh, user growth. I think we, we had a very good product, but we were unable to crack uh, user acquisition because it was a very competitive, it's now even more competitive with Microsoft Teams and all these other players coming into the picture. So um, that's essentially what Flock was. I think if you start using it, you realize that in terms of features, it's pretty competitive to Slack, but obviously it, we don't have that virality to get those user base.